I, I normally like to start with low expectations. Uh, you know, I have five degrees, but my wife has a PhD in molecular biology. So, you know, I'm more about quantity of degrees, and she's more about quality of degrees. Now, I suspect people in this room lean towards that PhD side, so I'm, I'm not going to comment on that. Uh, it's, it's really exciting for me to be here. It was a, a great day so far. I've learned a lot, and it's going to be a tough act to follow to say something that hasn't already been said. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about how to talk about some of these challenges and issues that we face. Uh, the title of my talk, Can Agriculture Save the Planet Before It Destroys It?, is sometimes a little bit provocative for people because in many ways there's nothing we do that has a bigger, more negative impact on the planet than agriculture, and yet there's nothing more critical for our daily survival. So the challenge is how do we maintain and grow those benefits and reduce the negatives? And this is a big challenge. Now, uh, Roger mentioned that I spent 13 years at the State Department, and the question always was, well, what's the difference between what you do at the State Department on food and ag and what they do at USDA? And I would say, well, that's really easy. At USDA, they do things. At the State Department, we talk about doing things. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure the VCs in the room appreciate that because they probably talk a lot about what other people are doing. So we have a lot in common. So let's, let's look at some of those challenges, though, that we all face. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to tell you a little bit about us. How many people have heard of Intrexon? Raise your hand. Okay, not a lot, but more than usual. That's a little disappointing. Um, if you look here, you have, let's see. So this is moving as a, uh, as a PDF as opposed to the individual slides. Is there anything we can do to, to fix that? It's not a PowerPoint. So I'll go, go through some of the things we do. Uh, how many people have heard of the Arctic apple? It's a genetically engineered non-browning apple. That, that's us. Now available on Amazon, the uh, dried app bits, uh, number one selling dried fruit product on Amazon. Really happy about that. By the end of this year, more than a million trees will have been planted of our Arctic apples. Really excited. Uh, what about the aqua bounty salmon? That's, we're a majority shareholder in that company. It's a salmon reaches full size in half the time using a third less inputs. Uh, Transova, if there are livestock people in here, one of the largest livestock genetics companies in the United States. And some of you may have heard of the genetically engineered mosquitoes fighting Zika. That's another one of our companies. Uh, but we also have those same self-limiting insects in agriculture for fall army worm, diamondback moth, uh, medfly, olive fly, pink bull worm, and other things. So we're, we're doing a lot. I'm not really going to spend much time talking about the things that we're doing. I'm going to really spend a lot more time talking about the things that you guys are doing. So if we were talking about uh, land, 40% of all the land on Earth that could be used for agriculture is already being used for agriculture today. The amount of crop land is the size of South America. The amount of pasture land is the size of Africa. So I think we all agree that the footprint of agriculture in terms of land is as big, if not bigger, than we'd all want it to be. All right, well, so this is the RLC today. If we had the animations, you would see what it looked like in 1973. Uh, and the point is that this is agricultural withdrawals because of water. So 70% of all fresh water goes to agriculture, as you all know. But these aren't the problems of 2050. These are the realities of today. If we were talking about the Colorado River, it no longer flows to the sea. So see, these are some of the challenges that you're all trying to help address. Again, this should start out as a forest, which transitions into cropland, because 10 to 15% of all greenhouse gases come from agriculture, another 10 to 15% from deforestation, 80% of which is caused by agriculture. So that's 25 to 30% of all greenhouse gases coming from agriculture. That's more than anything except energy, and it's almost as much. 90% of what we hear in the newspapers, though, is about energy policy, virtually nothing about food policy. And yet, for every dollar you invest in wind and solar, you get less than a dollar back because they're less efficient than fossil fuels. Now, those are critical, long-term investments for our future. But for every dollar you invest in agriculture, you get $1.43 back everywhere in the world. Positive rates of return. 
So you have to wonder, would consumers rather pay more for their energy or less for their food to get a cleaner environment? And what I know of most Americans, they'd rather eat their way to a cleaner environment. And I can say that because I don't work for the government anymore. So how do we get people to recognize the opportunity of agriculture instead of the problems of agriculture? Now you all know better than most that we're going from 7 billion people to 9 or even 10 billion people by 2050. That's a challenge. But it's a challenge for other reasons. We have 800 million people who will go to bed tonight hungry. We have 9 million people who will die of hunger this year. That's more than malaria, it's more than road accidents, HIV. You add all of those things up and it's less than hunger. And yet how many headlines does it get? And part of the problem is that 9 million is such a big number that we can't even wrap our minds around it. So let's think of it in a different way. Today, 25,000 people will die of hunger. Over the course of this presentation, 1,000 people will die of hunger. That's one person every four seconds. How do we make it clear that that one person is a person that we should care about instead of that nine million, which is a statistic that we can just move on from? How do we get people to stop and pause? Now, you know that we need between 70, 100% more food by 2050, and we have to do it using less land, less water, and fewer resources. So we have to do everything better tomorrow than what we're doing today, and that is a challenge. But there are other challenges. Some of you may have seen this new book, The Wizard and the Prophet, and it talks about two different visions for how the future is going to go. On one hand, you have the wizards, the, the uh, Norman Borlaugs of the world, who believe that technology will help to grow us out of our problem. And you have the prophets in the book, uh, William Vogt, one of the progenitors of the environmental movement, who believe that we need to be doing less. We need to lower the impact that we're having on the environment. So in some sense, this is the, we can have our cake and eat it too, and we should just eat less cake. Now, I tend to be an optimist. I believe that we can have our cake and eat it too, but I'm also a husband, and my wife tells me that I need less cake. So I suspect that both of those visions are right. Now, some of you may have seen the movie Infinity War. And in this movie, the bad guy is somebody called Thanos. And in the movie, he is referred to as a prophet. And he is a prophet because he believes the universe has too many people and that we need to reduce them. And so if you go and you watch the movie, watch the movie through the lens of wizards and prophets. Because the good guys are the wizards, literally, in one case who believe that science and technology can help solve the problems of humanity. And so we're going to talk a little bit about this today. How does science and technology, and in this room we have wizards and prophets, those who are working to create more and those who are working to use less. And we need all of those. And this relates to trends that are happening. And so I want to talk to you about two important trends. One are trends in technology and innovation, and the other is trends in consumer attitudes, because both of those impact what you do. Now, one of the challenges that I find when it comes to what's happening in the future and trends is that everybody wants to look at what's happening and then just look at, imagine it's going to keep happening all the way into the future. And so on one hand, back in 2002, the world was running short of food and we had high food prices and people thought, or low food prices, and we thought it was going to go on forever. And then as soon as we had the food price crisis, if you looked at all the estimates for the next 20 years, we were going to have high food prices as long as we could see. And so we keep projecting into the future today, this moment. And when you look at companies that are all working in the same space, where you find five or ten different startups all doing the same thing, generally it's because linear thinking has gotten them to that point, because they all had the same th idea at the same time, because it follows from what happened right before. But in order to distinguish yourself from that, you need to not look at the trends, 
you need to look at the trend of trends. And so I'd like to start with some of those trends. And part of what you want to do is you want to break down products to understand the processes which are the trends behind them. So people are talking a lot about blockchain. Blockchain is really exciting. But what is blockchain? Blockchain is a combination of cheap parallel computing, the existence of big data, and really smart algorithms. And those three things pulled together have given us blockchain, and they've given us other technologies as well. But it's those underlying trends that made blockchain possible. And those underlying trends make lots of different innovations possible, not just the thing that everybody's focused on. So everybody might be focused on blockchain, but what other things could those trends do for us? I'm going to talk about some of them. I really like the comment that Connie made this morning about never use the word disruption with farmers. And it's true. The people in this room, how many people in the room like change, are really comfortable with change? Quite a few. Well, inside in Washington, D.C., where I live, people are pretty comfortable with change. And in the rest of America and in the rest of the world, change is generally a bad thing. Generally, when things change, they get worse, they don't get better. If you want to understand the presidential election, it's about that distinction between change and how people view it. People thought, well, change is things are getting better, but for most people, change makes them uncomfortable. Understanding what drivers are, though, is still important because we still need that innovation. So I'm not going to talk about all of these, but I will be talking about some of these different drivers of innovation and how they build up to larger trends. So one of them is artificial intelligence. And so there's a lot of conversation about what artificial intelligence is. And what that tells me is artificial intelligence has not arrived. How often do you have conversations with your friends about the applications of electricity? Probably not very often. And yet it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It makes everything possible. And when the lights go out, you know it. But when the lights are running, you don't think about it. So electricity. We're, at, we're like the start of electricity 100 years ago, 130 years ago, where electrical production had to be close to the thing it was going to do. And electricity replaced work. Well, artificial intelligence will replace brain power in the same way that electricity replaced physical power. But when it happens, when it arrives, we won't think about it anymore because it'll just be the thing that makes other things happen. And it won't be cool, and it won't be interesting, and it won't be sexy. But we know it hasn't arrived because we're still talking about it. So artificial intelligence, if you create an embodiment of that, a physical body is a robot. So a robot is nothing but artificial intelligence put into a specific place and time. But again, how we think about trends is important. So 200 years ago, 70% of all Americans were farmers. And today, of course, that's about 1% and going lower because of robots. But think about what ro robotics means. So why do we have all the production in China? It's because of cheap labor. Well, if robots make labor cheap, then production in China, the expensive part becomes transportation. So today we do it in China because of labor costs. But if labor costs go down, transportation becomes the biggest driver, well, now all of a sudden, maybe it makes sense to have production down the street. And remember some of those other trends that we talked, that were up on the screen? Well, people want things today. So they don't want to wait for something to be shipped halfway around the world. They want to be able to go online, design their t-shirt, and have it arrive that evening. So, the trend of artificial intelligence made robotics possible. Robotics makes labor reduction cheaper. That's going to change all of global transportation. That's going to trade all of global trade. So understanding the trend of trends can put you ahead of the trend. Inversion is one that I like. So if you go back to when the early days of electricity, rich people had electricity and poor people didn't. But as soon as electricity became ubiquitous and all, everybody could have it, rich people started using candles. <laughs> because they're artisanal. They're cool. But 
if everybody had candles, well, maybe we wouldn't want candles. Maybe we want LEDs. Maybe we want trees that glow, right? So understanding inversion theory is important because it helps us to understand what happens when things become free or they become so inexpensive that nobody really cares about it anymore. So I created a little bit of uh, excitement on LinkedIn when I posted that people will look back at the Amazon acquisition of Whole Foods as the beginning of the end of the organic food movement. It democratized organic food. Who would want it anymore? At least people that drive food trends. Now, it doesn't mean that we won't have something that's beyond organic or more intensive than organic or more challenging or whatever. But the point is, if you're somebody who drives food trends, you don't want something that everybody else has. And so we need to recognize exclusivity is what people that are driving trends want. They don't want ubiquity. So understanding trends can help. OK, we've got the slides. Thank you. Sorry, that was probably my fault in how I transmitted them to you guys. Um, so dematerialization. You may have heard of this idea. Dematerialization is just that over time, we use fewer and fewer resources to produce stuff. So if you look at a, a soda can and how many resources went into it back in 1980, that can weighed 19 grams, and today it's 12. So over time, we, we have taken out more and more of the material, but maintained its qualities. So how does that apply to food and agriculture? Well, I think indoor ag is the dematerialization of the farm. We got rid of the land and soil. We got rid of the sunlight. So what do these trends mean to us? So it's one thing to look at indoor ag as perhaps a consumer-driven trend, or a drive for healthy food or for local food, but it's also a trend related to how things are produced. Again, when we can change the perspective for how we look at it, we begin to see opportunities that we might not have seen before. Uh, ownership and transportation are definitely things that are uh, seeing lots of change. You know, before you would own your tractor, you would own your car, and then you might, we had rental cars, then you might just borrow a car from somebody so you didn't have to own it anymore or lease. But now we're going to sharing. And so the whole concept of transportation is going to be different for our children. They're not going to even think of transportation in the same way. Obviously, many people who live in a city don't own cars. But 20 years from now, people might not even understand why you would want to own a car. Why would you have one of your biggest assets sit unused 95% of the time. Why not just have your car show up when you need it and only pay for it as you use it? If you could reduce your transportation cost by 90%, that would seem to be something that was pretty obvious. So I think that these are trends that are going to change not just how we get around the city, but how cities are developed. So how will that trend change how everything else is structured? So again, understanding the trend of trends, I think, is what's going to be important for us. So now I want to switch to how consumers think about different uh, trends. So if we went back to the 1950s and 60s, what was cool in food? Well, TV dinners, right? That was high tech. We had taken food, and we had put it into these little compartments, and we had you know, reduced labor, and we had looked at it as technology and innovation, and it was exciting. If you, found, if you went in 1960, you went into a garden store, you could buy atomic energized seeds. They were seeds that were produced with uh, irradiation using a cobalt-60 radiation source. And people were excited to plant these gardens. If you've ever had a ruby red grapefruit from Texas produced with mutagenesis. If you want to see where you can find that, you can go on the mutant variety database. This is not an X-Men database. This is a UN database. <laughs> and you can find these varieties created through mutagenesis. And that was cool. It was exciting. And on the back, in small letters, these, these seeds are not radioactive. I thought that was good. Produced with gamma rays, not radioactive. So we thought about food in a certain way back then. And then if you fast forward a little bit to the 80s and 90s, food was about aspiration. Some of you may remember the Grey Poupon 
advertisement where the person pulls up next to the Rolls Royce and asks the person if he has any gray Poupon. And that's because in that purchase, you could demonstrate your aspiration for a lifestyle. And it was also, though, when Americans became introduced to a wide variety of foods. We went from having two tomato sauces, ragu and prego, to hundreds of choices. It turns out that a third of all Americans like chunky tomato sauce and just weren't getting it. And now we all have as many choices as we want. And we have thousands of uh, salad dressing choices. So this was a time when we were all expanding our palates and asp aspiring to new things. And our purchases told you something about who we were in terms of class, socioeconomic class. Well, where are we today? Well, we've gone from the age of conspicuous consumption, where we demonstrated we were better than other people by how many things we could buy. Today, we're in the age of conspicuous production. It's not about how much you can buy, but it's about the provenance of the products you buy. Where did they come from? What is their story? And again, these are important things to understand about the trends that are happening in our food today. So organic isn't just about some people wanting things that are environmentally friendly or socially friendly, but it's also about wanting to know the origin of their foods. It's about wanting to know the provenance of it. And so when you think about things like clean meat or cellular agriculture, how you frame that conversation is going to be critical to how the public thinks about it. Because people want to know the name of the cow. Well, how are you going to do that if it's just coming from a fermentation bank, right? You can still know the, same, the name of the cow, but that cow name will never change because it's the same uh, cells. So there's a danger that it's not going to fit into that frame that people are looking for. But it could. Instead of calling it clean meat, we could call it craft meat. And craft meat has a connotation of something that is small and local and artisanal, which these meat products could be. But it also talks about fermentation and other things, which is part of how you produce that product. You could have San Francisco meat that literally was a different product than New York and Memphis and San Diego. So every place could have it. And then all of a sudden, you do have a place associated with that product. And then you can tell that story of the provenance of your product. So being able to frame what you're doing in terms that people understand and resonate with the values that they hold is what's going to be important. Because today, people's pur purchases are an extension of their values. They want their purchases to mean something. It could be about environmental sustainability. It could be about social justice. But they want their purchases to mean something. So the important thing is that regulations tell us what we can do. But it's consumers that tell us what we should do. And they provide social license to allow us to do it. And as you're going and developing your technologies and your ideas, always keep in mind it is not enough that you are allowed to do something. You need that social license. You need consumers to want you to do that thing. And one of the challenges you will have, though, is that consumers have never cared more nor known less how their food is produced. And that's going to be a challenge for all of you is that when you ask people in cities how much do you think you know about food, they think they know more than people who live in rural communities. They might not be right. But you still need to work with people where they are. You can't expect them to come to you. So one of the thoughts I want to leave you with is that people love innovation almost as much as they despise change. And there is nothing they despise change more than in the food they eat. Because food is what brings us together as family, as friends. It brings us together as a community. If you mess with my food, you are messing with my family, and people don't like that. So you can't be surprised when there are these strong reactions to how people produce food. So how do we do it better? Well, one of the things that all of us need to do whether we're entrepreneurs or scientists or farmers, is that we need to do a better job at telling our story. And there are four things we need to think about. One is that we need to personalize our story. One of the things that Cecilia did when she started this morning is that she talked about her own personal experience getting on that tractor. And that told, her, told us who she was, 
where she comes from, and what she values. We need to acknowledge people's concerns. I spent 13 years working at the State Department, and I never once met a person who was anti-science. Now, I met a lot of people who didn't trust the government, who didn't trust big business, but they all love science. And as soon as we tell people they're anti-science, it's like saying, you're an idiot, but let's talk. I found that doesn't work as much as people might imagine. Just because we disagree with people doesn't mean we can't acknowledge that their concerns are real. We need to find ways of connecting. And we all agree on the challenges of agriculture and the need to sustainably and nutritiously feed people. So that's a lot to connect on. And if you do these things, you begin to build trust. And it's only at the point that you have trust that science has any role to play in a conversation. And that's pretty disappointing for those of us who love science. I was speaking to uh, the Association of Meat Scientists. There are like 800 meat scientists in the room. It's like as exciting as it sounds. And I told them, I said, if people don't trust you, science doesn't matter. And if people do trust you, science doesn't matter. Stop telling people what you do and tell them why you do it. If people get the why, they generally don't care about the what. And scientists have great stories. There's a really good reason people go into science, and it has almost nothing to do with moving chromosomes and other things. It's about their love and passion for ideas or innovation or helping to save the world. So I want to leave you with the idea of why this conversation matters so much, why now matters. We already talked about going from 7 to 9 or 10 billion people. But after 2050, things change. We're adding a billion people every 12 or 13 years today. But after 2050, we're going to add a billion people every 25 years. Every 12, that's hard. Every 25, well, we've done that before. So things get easier. So now imagine that we can keep the productivity we need to get to 2050 without cutting down our forests, without draining our rivers, lakes, and aquifers. If we do that, for the first time in human history, we won't need more food. For the, we won't be challenged in the same way. We have this opportunity of saving the planet. And after 2050, we can produce all of our food organically if we want in 2100. That's fine. Or we can produce it all intensively and take all of South America out of production. That's fine. We have options and choices in a way that we don't today. So I want to leave you with the thought that the next 35 years are not just the most important 35 years there have ever been in the history of agriculture, and they are. They're the most important 35 years there will ever be in the history of agriculture. And if we get there, we will save the planet. And if we don't, we're all screwed. Thank you very much. <laughs>